Good morning. actually going to use this periodic table later, so uh, I hope you still have one handy. Uh, one benefit of speaking toward the end of the week last is that uh, you already know uh, much of the basics. It's already been covered earlier in the week, so I'm going to use those skills you already know and not really cover the basics. So I'm John Seeley. Um, and there's my email address. If you want to email me with questions or whatever, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, if you put in your email that you are at the school. So uh, what we're going to cover is um, experimental x-ray spectroscopy. So you've been uh, hearing mostly computational uh, lectures, except for the very first ones on Monday by Professor Kunza, so this will be a continuation of the experimental aspects of X-ray spectroscopy. So I'll, uh, uh, this is just a brief outline. I'll talk about spectrometers, X-ray spectrometers in particular. Uh, when you do computational uh, simulations of spectra, you really need to know what kind of spectrometer recorded those X-ray spectra so that you can properly interpret the X-ray spectra. And there are uh, two types, uh, reflection crystals or Bragg crystals, transmission crystals, uh, Lowy crystals, and the uh, spectra I'll be showing will be mostly from transmission crystal type spectrometers. And then uh, in particular, I'll be showing you experimental spectra, and uh, most of those will be from large laser facilities or other large facilities like pulse power facilities that produce bright, hard X-ray spectra. And the science motivation, I think you already know by now, it's to uh, study uh, the atomic physics of uh, atoms and highly charged ions, uh, in particular inner shell transitions in high atomic number atoms, uh, copper, uh, higher tungsten, Z equals 72 from your chart, is tungsten, gold. And also um, X-ray transitions in those highly charged ions. Uh, you know by now that the highly charged ions, uh, inner shell excitations, helium-like transitions, these are really of uh, great interest now. We'll be talking about um, the types of sources where those hard X-ray spectra are produced. And in particular, uh, laser-produced plasmas, they tend to be hot uh, kilovolt temperatures, and they tend to be dense from solid density 10 to the 23 per centimeter cubed. And if the plasma expands down to 10 to the 20, 10 to the 19, that's still high density compared to tokamax or uh, solar or astrophysical plasmas, which are much lower density. So this area of research is called high energy density, or HED, uh, physics and plasma diagnostics. And then, of course, the codes. You've been hearing about all the nice codes that are, that are available and uh, have been made uh, free software in many cases on websites. So all of that is a really nice service by the uh, community of the more senior people you've been hearing, such as Xiong Kyung. 
and uh, Yuri Ralchenko and Howard Scott and all the others. So uh, one aspect of experimental x-ray spectroscopy is to validate those codes. Of course, we hope they're perfect, but the codes are not always perfect. So uh, when experimental spectra are recorded and the codes are used to simulate those spectra, sometimes they don't agree. The experiment might be wrong. No, that's not a possibility. So we usually look to the code to see if we can look to suggest some improvements in the code. And there's always this back and forth between the, the code developers and, and the experimentalists. So we're always going back and forth. And that's really part of the fun uh, aspect of this type of research. So the codes you're all familiar with, I'll not, not discuss those. So uh, one of the biggest motivations uh, is to um, use the x-ray spectra, interpret the x-ray spectra using codes to determine the properties of the x-ray source, namely the plasma. So uh, bound-bound transitions you know about, uh, measurement of uh, transition energies, and this is part of the atomic physics code validation process determine uh, ionization balance. That's part of the uh, kinetics code validation where the populations are calculated and the line strengths and the line ratios. And then to measure uh, plasma properties such as uh, the electron density, temperature, opacity. Opacity you've heard a lot from Howard Scott. Uh, continuum is always a big interest. Uh, where is the continuum? What's the real continuum? What, what uh, processes contribute to the continuum? And part of that is a super thermal electron energy component. In many plasmas, there's a thermal component that will be lower temperature, one, one EV or 100 EV or one kilovolt temperature in the case of the hotter laser-produced plasmas. But there might be a superthermal component that has much higher energy, 30 kilovolts, one MeV electron energy. So one uh, has to be aware of the different electron energy components in your X-ray source. And then, uh, Line widths, line shapes, energy shifts. For this, you need higher spectral resolution, and we can now achieve this in the hard X-ray region where the photon energies are 10 kilovolts and above. So measuring uh, Doppler broadening, which is a measurement of the ion temperature in the plasma. Stark broadening, which uh, Evgeny talk, talked about very well earlier in the week, is a measurement of the... Uh, uh, density in the plasma and opacity. And then the x-ray source might be uh, short time duration, uh, nanosecond, femtosecond in some cases. So, uh, and it also, the uh, uh, spectrometer might, might produce spectra with spatial resolution so that you can uh, see the spectral lines from the dense hot plasma core or from the lower temperature, lower density uh, plasma surrounding that core. So we have uh, temporal resolution. You can study the fast dynamics of how the plasma is formed and how the temperature and density are changing. And then finally, uh, absolute spectral line intensities. This also is part of the code validation process. Typically, we work with uh, relative line intensities, line ratios. But in some cases, you want to measure the absolute fluence from the plasma. And that's a strong function of the density, for example. So how well can those absolute intensities be calculated? So there's this back and forth between the experimental spectra and the simulated spectra. Okay, here, of course, there are many sources of x-rays in the universe. Uh, astrophysical, solar flares, uh, low-density laboratory plasmas like tokamaks, um, electron beam ion traps. These are low-density x-ray sources. 
higher density laboratory sources. Um, laser produced plasmas are really of great interest now because there's, there's some really very powerful uh, lasers around the world in different laboratories and they can produce very hot, dense, and bright X-ray spectra. So there are uh, long pulse lasers, long being relative term, uh, where the pulse duration is nanoseconds, 10 to the minus 9 seconds. That's considered long for a laser pulse. Short pulse lasers would be uh, picoseconds or femtoseconds, 10 to the minus uh, 12 and 10 to the minus 15 seconds. In the case of uh, free electron lasers, for example, fem femtosecond type pulse duration. And then pulse power generators, uh, that's a high density uh, laboratory source, but a longer duration, like 50 nanoseconds or 100 nanoseconds. But these can be, be extremely bright X-ray sources. Uh, X-ray free electron laser, XFEL, uh, the first really uh, good uh, operating uh, a laser was in Germany called Flash, and it started out as a ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet um, source with uh, wavelengths around 50 angstroms or 100 angstroms, and then it has become much more uh, energetic photons. And then uh, in the U.S., um, there's the uh, LCLS uh, free electron laser. I'm trying to remember what the acronym is, uh, Linear Coherent Light Source, I think. And uh, this is located in California at the Stanford uh, Research Laboratory. And it uh, can produce um, X-ray laser beams, uh, coherent uh, pencil type X-ray laser beams up to, uh, uh, soon it'll be up to uh, 25 kilovolt photon energy. Uh, Europeans are now uh, extending the flash uh, facility up to higher energies, and uh, European XFEL will uh, leapfrog uh, LCLS and become the most, uh, produce the highest energy uh, photons soon. And then um, uh, laboratory uh, X-ray sources are typically used for testing uh, your X-ray spectrometer before you take it to one of these large facilities because you want it to work on the first attempt. Uh, you don't want to be embarrassed. You want to test it first so it works. And also uh, calibrations are done uh, using laboratory sources and I'll be talking in particular about an electron bombarded anode. So you have a source in the laboratory with a cathode that produces the high energy uh, electrons. Those are accelerated by a large potential like 300, um, uh, 300 kilovolts in the case of this source. And those 300 kilovolt electrons bombard an anode, which is typically a metal, like tungsten, and then that produces uh, energetic uh, photons from the anode material, which might be tungsten or um, uh, copper, whatever you choose. And then there are uh, very high energy uh, radioactive sources, uh, X-rays and gamma rays. So here's an example of a, of a spectrum of iron from a solar flare produced by a satellite uh, spectrometer. So this was in orbit above the atmosphere. The X-rays do not reach the surface of the Earth. They're absorbed in the atmosphere, which is good for us. So we're not getting an X-ray dose continuously. So this spectrometer is on a satellite facing the sun, and it's just a simple flat crystal which rocks back and forth and scans the photon energy which is uh, diffracted to, to a detector. So this is the only uh, spectrum I'll show using wavelength of Guinea. All the other spectra will be versus photon energy, and I do recommend that you use uh, versus photon energy, but in the solar community, it's always wavelength. So uh, here's the spectrum uh, diffracted from one set of crystal planes, which are the uh, germanium 220 planes. And this is a uh, crystal uh, made of germanium. It's a perfect crystal in reflection. And the uh, lattice planes, which are diffracting, the crystal was cut. 
so that the 220 planes are parallel to the surface of this reflection crystal. So this spectrum is from the 220 um, uh, Miller indices plane. And then there's a higher resolution spectrum here displaced from the 1, 3, minus 1 planes, which have a smaller uh, lattice spacing, so higher dispersion, better resolution. And uh, this was completely unexpected, this higher resolution spectrum. And uh, w we wrote several papers on this completely unexpected spectrum. So here's a blow up, and the quality is not, not very good because I've blown it up, but you can see the spectrum. So uh, when you look at a spectrum for the first time, you look for the strongest, most intense spectral line. So that's this line. It's a, it's a solar flare, it's a hot plasma. Uh, we know it's iron uh, from the uh, wavelength scale. And the strongest line you know by now in a hot plasma is the helium-like resonance line. So this is the helium-like resonance line, which we call W. So here's the transition from the singlet, P0, uh, a singlet P1 uh, level to the ground state. It's an E1 transition, so it's very strong. Typically, uh, practically always the strongest line in your spectrum. So now let's look for the other uh, helium-like transitions. We know, uh, you know these are weaker from what you've learned this week. And there's the uh, uh, M2 uh, transition from the triplet P2 level called X and then Y and Z. So uh, we have a wavelength scale based on the transition energy of the W line. And then from the spectrometer, which we've tested in the laboratory, we know the dispersion. Uh, we know how the uh, wavelength changes with rocking angle or position. So we have this uh, line W for the energy fiducial. Then we can calculate the uh, energy scale. And now we can look for the X transition because we know it's calculated transition energy and Y and Z. But there are all these other lines, which by now you know are the transitions in the lithium-like iron charge state from the doubly excited levels, the so-called dielectronic satellite transitions in lithium-like ion, which are satellites to the strong helium-like resonance line. So here are the um, identifications of the lithium-like dielectronic electronic satellite transitions in the lithium-like iron with a N equal to spectator. And then here are the same, uh, similar type transitions with an N equal three spectator, higher level, so the screening is uh, uh, smaller, so these transitions are closer to the resonance line. And all of these transition energies can be calculated and uh, the intensities, which are ch shown by the stick um, spectra. The, uh, and these uh, uh, letter designations I'll cover later, but this, this transition j called J is formed primarily by dielectronic recombination. And the ones with dash like Q and R are formed mostly by electron collisional excitation. So you can, uh, by calculating these line, line intensities using codes and assuming uh, a, a temperature and density, you can actually determine the temperature and density of this solar flare spectrum. So that's the power of X-ray spectroscopy. Interpret the spectrum, determine the properties of the X-ray source. So there are two types of uh, X-ray spectrometers. Uh, in reflection, it's called the Bragg case. So the crystal planes are parallel to the surface. And the Bragg condition is satisfied. Uh, N lambda equals 2d sine theta, where N is the diffraction order. Lambda is the wavelength. And we use wavelength because the uh, lattice spacing D is in uh, units of uh, uh, nanometers, for example, a length unit, so we're using wavelength. And theta is the angle of incidence. And the diffraction occurs over a very narrow angle range, so the angle of reflection 
is also theta within a very, very tiny uh, deviation in angle. And that's uh, given by the Bragg condition. In uh, transmission, this is called the Lowy case. Uh, Bragg and Lowy were uh, X-ray physicists, uh, crystallographers more than 100, roughly 100 years ago, I guess. And um, in the case of transmission, the diffracting planes are perpendicular to the surface, in reflection parallel to the surface, in transition, diffracting planes are perpendicular to the surface. Uh, incident ray still, still has the angle theta with respect to the diffracting planes, and the uh, diffracted ray is also theta, so the same, same Bragg condition. In the Bragg case, um, at uh, higher energies, shorter wavelengths, the angle theta becomes very small. So this is a very small grazing angle, and it's difficult to work at extremely small grazing angles like uh, one degree or half a degree or even several degrees sometimes. So um, Bragg case type diffraction in reflection is typically uh, angles, say, uh, 10 degrees or larger. Those are easy to work with, which means the photon energy is about 10 kilovolts or smaller. In the tr uh, transmission case, uh, uh, you're working with um, uh, angles uh, with respect to the um, crystal surface, and it's uh, much easier to work in transmission than at small grazing angles in reflection. So the um, Bragg angles can be much smaller, and the photon energies can be much larger, greater than 10 kilovolts. So uh, uh, 10 degrees, 10 kilovolts is sort of the place you switch from the Bragg reflection type spectrometer to the Lowy uh, transmission type spectrometer. These crystals can be bent. The, they can be bent uh, concave facing the X-ray source and or uh, convex. There, there can be single bending like uh, cylindrical bending. or uh, doubly bent, such as uh, spherical or conical bending. So the type of spectrometer I'll be talking about mostly is transmission type spectrometer, in particular where the crystal is convex facing the X-ray source. So the rays are uh, diffracted as they pass through the crystal, and they are uh, registered by a detector where the detector is on the so-called Roland circle. And the Roland circle has a diameter equal to the radius of, of the crystal bending. So if this is the crystal, here's the X-ray source, then the Roland circle has a diameter equal to the radius of the crystal bending. And it turns out uh, in this type of spectrometer that was uh, developed by uh, Cauchois in 1932, that the uh, spectral lines are focused on the Roland circle. So if your detector is on the Roland circle or even a flat detector tangent to the Roland circle, the spectral lines are focused, so you get very, very high resolution spectra. So here's a, a sketch of this type of spectrometer. And uh, they can be small, so this is uh, one, 107 millimeters, you know, uh, four inches, so they can be small and compact. You can carry them, uh, carry them around very easily. Uh, this, this is a bending form, and the crystal is bent onto that uh, mandrel, so it has the proper uh, cylindrical shape with the radius that you want. The x-ray source is over here, so the rays are... Uh, come through, uh, come through this window, pass through the crystal, are diffracted, and then they go to a detector. And then the rays above that are registered down here, and then other rays can come through this other window, and go to the top of the detector. And it turns out that the higher energy photons are diffracted with uh, small angles, as you know. And so they, those photons are 
uh, hitting the detector close to the spectrometer axis. So these are high energy photons, in this case 80 kilovolts, and then the lower energy photons have a larger uh, Bragg angle, so they are registered farther from the, from the spectrometer axis. So we get two spectra on the top of the detector and a second uh, mirror image spectrum on the bottom of the de detector, and here's a, a spectral image. So here's the spectrum on one side of the detector and the same spectrum on the other side. Uh, energy is going from high energies to low energies on this side and from high energies to low energies on this side. And this spectrum uh, happened to be from, from that tungsten laboratory source at NIST, uh, which I mentioned. So these are the tungsten characteristic K lines from, from that tungsten anode. And uh, um, uh, here's a line out of the spectrum. So, so this is the K alpha 1, K alpha 2. I think the battery in this is dying. Um, and then uh, K beta, and I'll uh, tell you what, what transitions that those are in just a moment, but for now just uh, keep in mind the type of spectrometer that, that we're using. So here is a, um, is a sketch of how those K transitions are produced. So uh, here's a uh, energy level diagram. Well, it seems to be seems to be weak, but it's working. It's a, it's a, okay. Thank you, though. Uh, can you see the laser pointer, or is it too weak? Huh? Too weak. Uh, okay, too weak. Um, so uh, this is a, a simple uh, level diagram of a. Uh, atom. So, so here's the uh, 1s k level, and the uh, unequal two levels are called L. So k and L, and the L1 uh, uh, refers to the 2s level, and the L2 and 3 refer to the uh, 2p levels. So L2 is 2p one half levels, L3 is 2p three halves levels. So if a energetic electron or a photon collides with this neutral atom, it can knock out a uh, 1s electron. So we have a hole, a 1s electron hole. And then a higher level electron can decay from a L level to the K level and fill that hole. When that happens, we get a so-called K photon. So these are the characteristic K transitions from, from this neutral tungsten atom, which the spectrum I just showed on the previous slide. And uh, when, when the L... Um, electron decays to the ground state, it leaves behind a, L, a hole in the L shell. Oh, that's much better. Yeah. Okay. Now I can stand back here. <laughs> so, uh, so now we have a hole in the L level. Well, that can be filled from a higher, uh, from, by uh, an electron from the N level, for example, and that produces a so-called L transition. Because, so K, K lines terminate on the K levels and L transitions terminate on the L levels. Pretty simple. And there are uh, many more L transitions because of the multitude of, of uh, states. So here's a diagram that shows you uh, what all of these designations are. So the K alpha uh, one and uh, these, this terminology is uh, historical, uh, developed by a physicist, uh, Siegbaum, you know, 50 years ago or so. But uh, this is something you need to know if you're going to be simulating X-ray spectra. So there are these KL-type 
designations, but uh, like I said, the lowest level, K, is simply a 1s level. So if you know the hydrogen atom, you can understand this very well. Uh, L1 refers to the 2s, L2 to the 2p a half, 2p, 2p three halves, and so forth. Uh, there's another uh, type of designation, um, K alpha 1, or it can be referred to as a K to L3 transition. So K is the lower level, L3 is the upper level. It's really quite, quite simple if you know the hydrogen atom, which I'm sure you all know. So here's a big table with lots of information, but um, I think it's simplest to look at this, this type of designation. So, so here are the, all the L, strong L lines from tungsten. Here are the uh, designations like I referred to L2 to M4 levels, but here are the hydrogenic type designations of these transitions. So um, the strongest line is L alpha 1. It's a L3 to M5 transition. L3 is 2p3 halves. M5 is 3p5 halves. So this you can really understand very easily. Okay, those are uh, radiative transitions, but if the uh, characteristic X-ray lines come, come from the higher-lying higher, higher lying levels, they can uh, not uh, radiate decay, but a faster process is, is OJ, and you've heard this before. So uh, OJ type transition, a uh, M electron fills a hole in the L level, for example, and then rather than emitting a photon, it ejects an M electron. So it's, it's a uh, radiationless transition. There's no photon coming out. But uh, these levels can be broadened by these very, uh, very fast uh, reactions. If, uh, so uh, uh, OJ process leaves two holes behind in the same uh, N-type N or uh, M level, same, uh, same group of levels. If the hole, if the two holes are left behind in two different uh, levels, L and M, for example, then it's called Koster-Kernig type transition. So uh, transitions from higher levels are not necessarily uh, radiative, but they are OJ or Koster-Kernig. And those fast OJ type transitions can can broaden um, broaden the spectral line. So we s see that the higher li higher lying tr transitions tend to be broad. So here's an experimental measurement of the width of the uh, two types of transitions from the O level uh, uh, n equal five level, very very high lying. Uh, so we measure the widths. And then we can calculate what are the cost occurring rates that uh, produced that broadening. So this is a experimental X-ray diagnostic that can be used to measure the OJ lifetimes or the cost occurring lifetimes. I'm going to speed up a little bit now because I've been going quite slow. So now I'll move to. Uh, a type of X-ray source which is called a pulse power generator. So this is similar to the laboratory tungsten source I described, where you have a cathode, an anode. Uh, fast electrons are accelerated to and uh, crash into the anode, which in this case is tungsten, and produce uh, hard X-ray spectra. Uh, the accelerating voltage here is about 2 MeV. And the current is very large, about 0.6 mega amps. This uh, type of generator would, would fill a, a room several times this size. So the voltage is high, the current is high, and the X-ray flux is extremely high. And it's uh, somewhat larger uh, duration because capacitors are used to store this energy. So the X-ray pulse duration is about 50, 50 nanoseconds. Here's a spectrum from uh, that, that type of source. 
So here are the L lines which you're learning about. Uh, so here's the um, L1, L beta 1 transition, which is a 2P1 half to 3D3 half type transition. Here's a L beta 2 transition from the 4P5 half level. And the vertical lines are the characteristic X-ray transition energies from the uh, neutral or uh, first ionized tungsten atom. So uh, what do you notice here? Well, this, uh, these calculated and experimental transition energies match very well. But look, this, this experimental transition has shifted to higher energy. Well, why is that? What do you think? 3P, 3D, 3P, 4D, N equal 4 level from a higher, a higher level. So this is from an ion, a, a, a somewhat slightly ionized plasma where the ionization is down to uh, just about the 4D level. So this 4D5 uh, has level is perturbed by ionization, but the lower levels, uh, 3D, 3P levels, are uh, more tightly bound, so they're less perturbed. So this transition is shifted to higher energy by ionization. So uh, whenever you're looking at X-ray spectra, first of all, look at the strong lines, uh, look at what you know, and then uh, notice things that are different or unexpected, do not match what you expect. So this, this is what we look for in experimental X-ray spectroscopy, what's unusual. Uh, we actually wrote a paper with Uri Ralchenko on this, just, just that. And uh, during that data analysis, we needed to calculate the shift in the transition energy with ionization. So that was done using the grant code, which, or GRASP code, which you've heard about. And here is the energy shift with ionization of the uh, lower level of the uh, L beta 1 transition from the three. Uh, integral three levels, so it's not shifted very much with ionization. But here is the uh, shift of the L beta two line from the 4D level, which is shifted with ionization. And here is the uh, derivative of the energy shift. So you see when the ionization is low, like uh, 6S being ionized, uh, 5D, it's a small shift in energy increasing but small, but when the ionization is now in the 4F, which is approaching the 4D level, then the energy shift becomes much, much larger. So this is an example of using the uh, GRASP code to interpret spectral line shift in the um, experimental X-ray spectrum. Okay, now moving to uh, laser-produced plasmas. Very energetic um, electrons can be, uh, be produced. Positrons can be produced if the focus intensity is high. Large currents, large magnetic fields. This is what a large laser facility looks like. There's a person. This is the laser lab at uh, Rochester in the USA. Uh, here's our spectrometer in a vacuum chamber which attaches to the larger uh, laser target chamber. Uh, this is the NIF laser at uh, Livermore. There's a person inside the vacuum chamber, the target chamber. So you can see this is huge. It's about six or seven meters in radius. So it's like a mountain climber inside the target chamber. Uh, these are spectra from the uh, Rochester Omega laser from a krypton-filled uh, gas bag type target. These, uh, this is the experimental uh, krypton spectrum. So we see uh, K-shell transitions and uh, uh, two to one type transitions, three to one type transitions, four to one type transitions. And then uh, uh, Hyun Kun uh, did some very nice calculations using flychuck, uh, simulating these spectra. So from these 
simulations, we can say that the electron temperature was 2.6 kilovolts. The electron density was 2 times 10 to the 18. Okay, now I'm going to move to another type of X-ray source, the uh, free electron laser. Uh, free electron lasers are very bright. Here's FLASH, LCLS, the uh, European uh, free electron laser. So this is actually a type of laser uh, j uh, similar uh, in principle to this uh, green laser, but it uses a uh, uh, what's called an undulator, which is a, a linear series of uh, strong magnets that are alternating south pole, north pole, south pole. So that causes the electron beam to oscillate in phase and photons from the uh, front end of the undulator can be amplified uh, uh, as they pass through these oscillating electron bunches. So, so the uh, beam of photons is amplified just like in this device, but now it's an X-ray beam, uh, much higher energy. So we did an experiment at uh, LCLS. Uh, here's the experimental group. And Every good experiment needs a good computational physicist to plan the experiment and to help interpret the data. So uh, here's the uh, free electron beam. It was um, uh, uh, one, to two, one to two kilovolt photon energy, very bright, very short duration, high repetition rate. So we were taking data almost continuously from this rotating target. We also had a smaller optical laser which uh, preformed a plasma on this aluminum target. So we shot the optical laser that preformed a uh, fairly hot aluminum plasma with charge states up to helium like aluminum preformed. And then we probed that plasma with a very short free electron laser. And we tuned the energy of the free electron laser to photoexcite transitions in that preformed aluminum plasma. So uh, when the laser, uh, uh, with, the, with the optical laser alone, for example, we saw uh, helium-like aluminum resonance line W. And then uh, when we tuned the, tuned the photon energy down in energy, we could, we could excite lower energy transitions in lithium-like aluminum, beryllium-like, boron, carbon-like, and so forth. So this is a way to tune your probing laser so that you can photo pump specific transitions in specific charge states. So it's a very powerful technique to uh, probe selected transitions. And it all depends on having this pump laser and the probe laser, pump probe type experiment. So here are the transitions from the optical laser. So uh, on a log scale, so this is helium-like resonance line W, Y, dielectronic satellites. And the satellite J is formed by dielectronic recombination primarily. And the other satellites are from electron collisional excitation. So you see the dielectronic satellite Transit, uh, J is rather strong in the optical laser only plasma because this is a, a short, short, a hot, dense, but short duration laser, so it's uh, recombining primarily. Here are the designations of all those satellites, and uh, this is in the literature, but uh, just call, call your attention that they are all from doubly excited levels in the lithium-like charge state. And some are primarily from dielectronic recombination like J. Uh, many of the others are primarily electron collisional excitation. So here's a spectrum with the pump laser applied to that preformed plasma. So we tune the free electron laser photon energy to uh, uh, resonantly photopump the helium-like Y transition. So this transition is normally weaker than the resonance line. It would be down here someplace. 
but when you photo pump it, it becomes quite intense. And also the uh, satellite transitions, which, are, which can be excited by electron collisions, they have a large oscillator strength and they can be photo pumped because of that large oscillator strength. So these satellite transitions, which are easily excited by electron collisions, can also be easily photo pumped. So the, there's a huge enhancement here. The dielectronic satellite J is formed mainly by dielectronic recombination, and it is not, not photo pumped at all. So here's a, a composite of the um, photo pump spectra, which are the upper spectra and the optical laser only spectrum without photo pumping. And you see the uh, big enhancement of the satellite transitions, which, which can be photo pumped. And the J transition, uh, a dielectronic type transition is only slightly enhanced on this log scale. Uh, here's another composite of uh, photopumping the uh, lower charge states of aluminum. So here's the uh, lithium-like uh, transitions be being photopumped by, by tuning the free electron laser photon energy to, to this position. And then uh, when we tune the free electron laser down in energy, we can photopump uh, boron-like, carbon-like, uh, nitrogen-like. Uh, this uh, free electron photon energy, f for example, photo pumps the carbon light. So, so this is a very uh, powerful way of uh, photo pumping selected transitions in selected charge states. Uh, Yuri uh, did a very nice uh, plot uh, calculation of um, what transitions are pumped when you tune the, the uh, free electron laser in photon energy. And then here is the uh, axis for the aluminum transition energies. So here are the transition energies from uh, the aluminum ions, and here is the tuned free electron photon energy. So when you're tuning to high energies, you're producing uh, mostly helium-like. There's uh, not much, uh, basically nothing in here from the lower charge states when you're tuning at high energy. When you tune the free electron energy down, then you excite the lithium-like transitions, tune lower, beryllium-like, and so forth. Okay, now I'll um, move to another subject, which is uh, absolute calibration of your X-ray spectrometer. So uh, typically you've seen we look at the uh, uh, relative uh, line strengths, and you can learn a lot about the uh, plasma from the relative line strengths, but sometimes you want to know the absolute fluence from your plasma. So for that, uh, uh, we need to absolutely calibrate the sensitivity of the spectrometer. And this we do at uh, NIST. There are other places you can calibrate spectrometers, but at NIST there's a absolutely calibrated X-ray source. So here's the X-ray source. Uh, here's a uh, ionization chamber detector, and then we can place our spectrometer here in front of this X-ray source. We know the absolutely calibrated fluence from that X-ray source. We can measure a signal with our spectrometer, and then we can relate the two. And then when you take that calibrated spectrometer to a laser facility, for example, and you measure a signal on that spectrometer, based on the absolute sensitivity calibration, you can take your signal from the, from the laser-produced plasma, for example, and you can measure the fluence, absolute calibrated fluence, from that X-ray source. So here's a um, uh, signals from uh, several different absolutely calibrated sensors where we are measuring the fluence from the um, NIST X-ray source. So this uh, NS15 is a calibrated fluence from the NIST X-ray source. That's this curve. 
and this x ray, f and then the other curves are um, spectra recorded by several different types of x ray sensors. So these two curves are measurements from two different transmission crystal spectrometers with, that have uh, high, high resolution. So these uh, high resolution uh, tungsten L lines from the X-ray source were measured by these two high resolution transmission crystal spectrometers. And then this darker curve is from a silicon uh, photon counting sensor. It's got a, a silicon chip. The photon comes in, creates charge in the silicon chip. Uh, you measure the size of that charge, and that determines the photon energy. So that's what this, this darker curve is. It's uh, lower resolution than the crystal spectrometers, but the curves uh, pretty much lie on the absolute fluence curve from the X-ray source. So that means we've uh, calibrated these th three different sensors to sort of this type of accuracy, which is about 10%, uh, 15% uh, in some cases. So the absolute instrument calibrations can be done. It takes a lot of effort, but it can be done to about 10 or 15% accuracy. Okay, I think I'm just about finished. So I just want to uh, give you an introduction. When we come back, we'll have... Experimental X-ray spectroscopy part two. And uh, during that 50 minute time period, uh, we're gonna use the skills you've learned this week to analyze this spectrum. So this is an X-ray spectrum. Uh, at this point, we don't know what it is. Uh, what are the spectral lines? Can we determine the plasma temperature and density from whence this X-ray spectrum came? Can we determine uh, temperature density? Can we de determine other properties of that plasma, like the plasma expansion velocity? Will there be some unexpected discoveries? And the answer is yes. So when you come back, we will go through the analysis, and I hope you'll help and uh, make suggestions as we go through. I'll stick around during the break if anyone...